Hello and welcome to the Careers in Sport webinar focusing on sports coaching. My name is Amri Batson. The sports industry has a diverse range of professions and careers. And did you know that careers in sport can help people on and off the pitch? So if you fancy being a physiotherapist, a nutritionist, maybe work in media, maybe even work in coaching, then you've come to the right place. And did you know over 200,000 14 to 18 year olds will qualify with a sports qualification. But I'm not alone today. And as I mentioned, we're talking about sports coaching and I've been joined by some leading professionals who are gonna to talk to you about their journey and give you some wise words of wisdom. So please, can we say hello to Nick Levitt, who's the head of coaching for UK Coaching. How's it going, Nick? Yeah, all good, thank you, all good. Thanks for joining us. Hello to Sean Kitson, who's the development manager for Coaching for Sport England. Hiya, I hope everyone's well. Good to see you. And Lydia Bedford, who's the England women's under, C under 17 head coach. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us in this webinar. Your time's really appreciated. So let's start right at the beginning. How did you get to where you are today and why did you decide to go into sports coaching? Let's start with you, Nick. Uh, well, it was a while ago now. I had um, normal coloured hair at that stage. Um, so I took a, a route through kind of um, GCSEs and A-levels. I did A-level PE, but didn't really know what I wanted to do. But I like playing football, so I went off and did a sports degree. But again, even at the end of my sports degree, didn't really know what I wanted to do. Went off to America, did some coaching over there for a few months in California and Nevada, which was a great experience. Then came back and found myself kind of falling into a sports development officer job in Norton Keynes at a specialist sports college at the time. And then that was a very multi-sport role, but my, my passion still was in football at the time. So found my kind of way through into a, a county football association before moving to the FA and leading national projects at the FA all the way through to working with the England national boys teams from under 15 all the way through to the seniors with Gareth Southgate before moving across into a head of coaching role at UK Coaching, which is now the whole coaching pathway from grassroots and uh, kind of core sport, club sport, all the way through to the Olympic pathway and high performance. Sean, for you, you've been at uh, Sport England for five years, but of course you've had a, a very varied career. Tell us about it. Yeah, um, so I suppose my involvement in coaching um, and working in this industry stems from being a participant, being a being a player, being a, a football player and, and, and a futsal player. And I guess my my passion and my involvement into the industry has come through that. Uh, I went to university, really um, picked up a, a degree in coach education, sports development. And I guess my passion for sport, I always knew I was going to work in sport because, to be honest, there wasn't much else I was good at. Um, but I didn't know where. I didn't know where that was going to be and, and obviously carried on playing. And I also uh, found an opportunity at, uh, as an administrator at a county FA. And that was my first, my first full-time job, just um, doing sort of the, the bookings, the administration side of it. But over the last sort of 10 years or so, um, yeah, I've had opportunities in leisure, worked as a leisure centre manager had opportunities in education, um, supporting physical education in secondary schools, and more recently at a county sports partnership, and then obviously the last few years at Sport England. So yeah, quite quite varied, um, but it's always been linked to coaching in some aspect. Lydia, did the dream of becoming a coach start as a teenager or did it come on in later life? Um, yeah, so it's, it's a random one for me, actually. I didn't really play a lot of football growing up, always loved it, um, but didn't really have the opportunity to access it based on where I lived. Um, so took up other sports, but had a real passion for sport um, and had fantastic role models in the PE teachers that I had growing up. So when I came to thinking about A-levels, you know, A-level PE was a really easy choice. It was what I enjoyed doing. Um, and pretty much from that moment when I was thinking about a career, um, my first thought was to train to be a PE teacher. So once I finished my A-levels, I went to Brunel University in London and did a four-year uh, teacher training PE combined degree that meant I was out on placements each year of my course in schools. And when I graduated four years later, I went straight into um, teaching as a secondary school teacher um, in Aylesbury. 
where I did four years. Um, but pretty much from the moment I went to university, I got involved with the women's football team, uh, realised that I enjoyed playing quite quickly from the coach that I had, got pushed towards doing a level one just to kind of help with my degree. I realised I loved uh, coaching and I worked with grassroots kids and kind of from that moment onwards, it spiralled uncontrollably for the whole four years I was at Brunel and I ended up leaving um, four years later with a B licence and pretty much spending most nights um, of my week outside of any kind of university commitments coaching football. So when I started teaching, teaching almost became kind of like a means to allow me to continue coaching and I was, you know, working full time in the day as a teacher, but then coaching different age groups of players in the evenings and games at the weekend. And that continued for around five years um, before I had an opportunity to step into a role at the FA, which meant relocating um, and taking on a role that wasn't quite what I thought it would be initially in terms of it wasn't loads of coaching, but it was a real step in. And three years on from that, um, after being a technical talent coach in the East, I was um, given the opportunity to move into the international pathway, having assisted age groups. And yeah, I've been a head coach now for just over three years. And um, you know, I thought PE teaching would be a lifetime career, but I found a passion elsewhere. And I think my teaching background has really helped my um, coaching now. I'd like to stick on that point, if I can, with you, Lydia, about starting out as a, as a PE teacher, because, you know, back in the day, 10 years ago, if you became a PE teacher, there wasn't that many pathways to become a, a coach and reach the level that you have. What has changed that has enabled that pathway to grow, do you think? Yeah, I think... Um... I mean, I was just talking to someone about it this morning. I think, you know, 10 years ago, if you wanted a career in sport, PE teaching was pretty much, you know, the main one. Um, and everyone, if you'd have asked them growing up, wanted to be a PE teacher. I think now there's a lot more accessibility and visibility in terms of the types of roles that are out there and many more full-time positions. In fact, I was chatting to someone else this week about the fact that the first full-time job in football that I could access just happened to be one at the FA. Whereas I think, you know, five, 10 years on from that now, finding a full-time job within football as a coach is is much like more widely well there's many more opportunities to do that so and many more different pathways that you could take within that Nick can I ask you what is it about coaching that you love so much well it's one of those things I think that if you if you're going to coach and be effective as a coach you really need to start to understand your own kind of values and beliefs and what drives you so I think when I was a bit more of a novice coach, I got really hung up on the um, the technical and tactical stuff and, you know, the things that I thought made a difference. But really having those kind of values and beliefs about what you stand for really should be the first port of call for you as a coach. And I, I've done a lot of soul searching on this and I, I used to think it was about making a difference. And I, I've gone beyond that now. And I think it's about seeing people happy. and you know, I've always coached alongside my kind of professional job, if you like. And I think seeing other people happy, seeing them grow, seeing them mature as young people um, and also get a bit better at football is, is probably what drives me, I think. Sean, can I ask you um, one of the questions that I got asked actually is that how do we inspire and encourage a pathway for talented students to take up qualifications in all sports? which may lead into a career in sport for the future? Yeah, no, it's a really good, really good question. Um, I think, I think the, first, the first thing that we need to do and, and we're trying to address is, is provide a pathway that, that's clear for young people, for talented young people who want a career in sports coaching. So going back to Lydia's um, response in regards to becoming a PE teacher and then moving into coaching. Yeah, I, I, I remember speaking to lots of people at university in that setting where I was and yeah they, they only had PE teaching in their mind yet the opportunities are much more um, wide ranging and, and, and lots of variety in them so the first thing is can we provide a pathway uh, and we're work, doing lots of work with our Chartered Institute to do that a pathway into to sports coaching that offers lots of different opportunities whether that be uh, working in the talented arena whether that be working with uh, allied health professionals and supporting people with disabilities or long-term health conditions, whether that be working in your local community hall or your local traditional sports club. So the opportunities now are growing. We, we have seen since 2012, I think it's something like a 20% increase in the number of roles, the number of jobs available across our sector. And it's, are we able to, I suppose, um, inspire our next generation and also provide really clear 
clear routes into into those different avenues. That's that's something we need to work on. That's something that we, we have to get better at because I still think there's a little bit of a disconnect between some of the entry routes into sports coaching and actually what's out there. And we need to join those two things up. Yeah, brilliant point, brilliant point. So if somebody's decided that they they want to go into a, a sports coaching career, let's start with you, Lydia. What would be the first steps to achieve that? Um, I think you probably need to think about, you know, what part of sports you want to go into, um, you know, from a coaching perspective, what level of the game is your aspiration to work at, um, you know, and, and what are you good at? So I think a lot of coaches want to like see moving up age groups as, you know, the natural progression, you know, the senior game being kind of the pinnacle, but actually you can be a brilliant um, six to 11 year old coach and have a real skill set that's going to, you know, drive th those sessions and bring kids to life when they get on the pitch. And, and so I'm a big advocate of really thinking about what your individual skill set are, what you're comfortable doing. And I think it's right that you should always stretch and, and try and push yourself to try new things, but actually being OK with what what you do brilliantly and, um, and just focusing on that as kind of your main avenue. I can see you you're nodding your head, Nick, as Lydia was talking there. I mean, the question I've got, though, is if you to be a good coach, do you need to be somebody who lives and breathes that sport? Uh, yeah, I was nodding with Lydia because I was probably a good example of what she was talking about there. I, I worked at a Premier League Academy for six, seven years, and I just worked with nine and ten year old kids because that's what I loved doing. I had no desire to go up to be. 14, 16s, 18s coach, like some coaches might have seen that as the route through. And I think she's spot on with what she was saying there. Um, do you have to, I, I think you have to be passionate it, because it then means it's less work, if you like. Like I've not done a day's work in my life, really. It's, it's fortunate that I just love what I do. And I think if you have the passion for the sport, that helps. But if you're going to be uh, making that kind of move from good to great in terms of being a coach, I think you have to be passionate about the process of coaching and the love of coaching. That means I want to get really, really good at the process of coaching. And also you have to be passionate about helping athletes, players, young people, adults, whoever you're working with, you have to be passionate about helping them get better because one of the key things is for coaches to realize that it's not about themselves. It's about giving to others to help them improve. And that's a crucial part of what we see makes the distinction between good to great coaches. Sean, does somebody have to have a degree to become a good coach? In, in, in the short answer would be no, no, not necessarily. No, there's loads of loads of different routes into into coaching. Um, I think it goes back to my previous comment that it's perhaps not as well understood perhaps 10 years ago in the ways in which you could enter into coaching. So I think there's all sorts of different pathways. Uh, the simplest way might be starting off as a volunteer, gaining that practical experience in your local community, working with different audiences. And going back to Nick's point, starting to figure yourself out what's important to me around why I coach, where I coach, who I coach. Um, I think there's opportunities in terms of getting yourself on the, the coaching ladder in terms of qualifications. There's lots of different routes, lots of different opportunities there. Um, apprenticeships really interest me. Apprenticeships really interest me because of the current situation that we find ourselves in. I think there could be lots of opportunities to to grow and increase the number of um, young people, talented young people who learn on the job and access practical skills on the job. Some of the experiences that we as individuals may have taken X amount of years to, I suppose, uh, obtain. Can we do something a little bit more modern in terms of our learning experiences for our young people? So higher education, further education, they are, they are options, they are routes. But I think there's probably something about the passion, the desire, um, understanding yourself that probably trumps all of those different things. And of course, just sticking with that point, actually, Sean, that you mentioned about all the, the different pathways, can it be though a little bit overwhelming for somebody who wants a career in sport but doesn't know what first step they should take? Absolutely. So one of the big things, and, and I'm sure Nick will, will touch on this as well. One of the my, one of my top tips, I suppose, I know we're not coming on that till till later, would be to get good people around you, whether that's a, a mentor, whether that's a coach developer, whether it's just a significant other. I think helping young people to make sense of who they are and what they want to go and achieve, not direct them, not lead them, 
but simply be someone who can ask a question, who can help somebody out when they're not sure where to go. Where do I go and access this training? What are the opportunities available in my local area? A, a great example is Street Games, who one of our national partners who work with young people, uh, particularly from lower social economic groups. Now, they have a Coachmates program, and they are taking these young people. And the, for me, the most significant element of that program is the fact that they have a mentor or a coach developer supporting them all the way, helping them to guide through what can be, yeah, quite a, quite, I suppose, um, complex route, if you like, or a complex pathway. So I think, yes, it can be. We're working hard to try and remove some of those barriers in terms of that confusion or that frustration. I'm not sure my, my, the obvious route for me. And I think having that significant person to support you is, would be one of my top tips anyway. Nick, is there anything you want to add to that? No, I would, no, I would echo exactly the point that, that Sean said. And you know, I think it'd be an interest, interesting question for, for Lydia about, you know, uh, who who was the key kind of person in your life because one of the challenges we still have in the system is how do we make sure that we are representative of the people that play the sport throughout the pathway so you know Lydia would have had different challenges to I might have done or Sean might have done so it'd be really interesting to know from Lydia you know who who were the key people in her life that have helped her get through that pathway and uh, and what did she take from them that's made a big difference? Yeah, um, I, listening to it, I was just, you know, the people pop into your mind straight away, if I'm honest. Um, for me, like there's been key pivotal people, probably, you know, three really key ones. And, and for me, the first one was my university football coach, because without him um, identifying that like coaching might be something I could do and offering me a a course at the Christmas of my first year that had a 50% bursary and encouraging me to go on it, I, I probably wouldn't have, um, you know, followed the, the formal qualifications in football as quickly as I did. And from the moment I got that qualification, he ran a grass a grassroots, sorry, program in Watford, and he offered me the ability to go and coach young girls every Saturday, which, if I'm honest, initially was, you know, it's an opportunity to earn a bit of cash while I was at uni, um, but it, it spiralled into, you know, me sitting here now with, with the job I've got. So I'm very grateful to him for his guidance and the opportunities he gave me. And, and that included actually recognising when it was the right time to help me move on. And once I'd got my level two and I was still working with him in Watford, the opportunity came up for me to be able to move into the Girls Centre of, Ex Center of Excellence pathway in Watford. And that was a big of a bit of a heart pull for me to leave his company and all the work I'd done with him to go into that environment. But actually, that environment led to me moving a year later into Middlesex Centre of Excellence, where I'd probably say the next really key individual in my career progression was. And that was the, um, the technical director of that Centre of Excellence. Her name was Tracy Kevins. And for me, she offered a, a, a basically an opportunity to have an attainable role model. She was the head coach at Barnet Lady. She was the technical director of the Centre of Excellence. She kind of took me under her wing and she also assisted Mo Marley with the under 19s at England. So immediately I had a touchable role model who was living and breathing exactly, you know, what I thought I might want to do in the future. And, and that makes a big difference, I think, because um, the relationship you build with those people, uh, the support they can give you, the networks they can help you create are, are really key. And, and she was, again, a pivotal person in me moving on to my A licence. Um, a couple of years after I'd graduated uh, university and key in kind of telling me that it was the right moment to do that. And I probably wouldn't have had the confidence about her to take that step. And that probably brings me to my third one, which is Brent Hills, who used to run a female mentoring program for female coaches that were coming into the game um, across England. And he was also the assistant coach to Hope Powell with the women's seniors. So again, great connections who really, you know, encouraged and developed me as an individual and, and helped, um, to yeah to give me a, a path into the place i am now i'm going to come on to connections in a, in a bit because i think that's a really important subject we need to talk about but lydia i'm just going to stick with you for a second because of course women's football in england and in scotland has grown massively over the last five years or so i'm not going to put you on the spot who you think should be the next england senior women's manager i wouldn't do that to you but how encouraging is it to see more women wanting to become football coaches Oh, I think it's brilliant. You know, I've got two young nieces that are girls. My sister doesn't particularly like football, so I'm their only kind of source of any football. Um, and like even just seeing the engagement of them in things like the Women's World Cup, like it's so it's so um, 
just visible and the opportunities are there for people to be able to get passionate about it and you know find their own way within it and, and that probably didn't exist you know 10 15 years ago so i think it'll have a massive impact um on the game and the growth of it and just the connection of the women's football um like family for want of another word is massive and um yeah hopefully it will continue to go from strength to strength and um, if you don't mind i'd just you know like to throw in something from one of the conversations you guys were talking about earlier around um, those that don't take degree options so um i'm really good friends with um a girl called or get a girl sorry i'm really good friends with a lady called vicky jepson she's currently the liverpool ladies manager and i actually called her this morning to have a chat about her kind of journey into football because i realized it was very different to mine yet she's working at the very top level um, of the women's game and, and vicky didn't go to university she worked for a community um, football scheme in Macclesfield Town. She spent some time like Nick in USA. Um, she worked in the Centre of Excellence programme for a number of years with the under 11s. She had six years as an under 11s coach, knowing that she had a real um, knack with those players. And then with opportunities that came to her through volunteering, started to get involved in the first team environment. And I just thought it was a really powerful role model for people to look up to who perhaps, you know, don't see university as, as a path that they want to take that actually you know, with the right people and the right opportunities, you can still make a fantastic career for yourself in the game. Yeah, great point, great point. Thank you for that. Nick, I just want to pick up, pick up what Lydia said about working abroad. Again, 5, 10, 20 years ago, that wouldn't have been an option, but you had that opportunity to go and work in the States, and I'm sure you loved the Californian sun. It, it was one of those that there was uh, a number of other people that I played in the men's kind of university football team with that were older than me that had gone on this jaunt across to the States and, uh, and done soccer camps throughout the States. And there was a company called Major League Soccer that used to kind of take lots of English coaches over there every year. And there was a number of these companies that still exist now and, and we're doing it back then as well. Um, it's one of those things I think that just gave me a different experience and three, four months working with, you know, five and six year old kids all the way through to under 18s that were going off to be part of the, uh, the ODP, the Olympic Development Program in the States. And you're working every day, you're staying with host families. And I was 21 at, at the time when I left to go over there. Um, I would thoroughly recommend it as a, as a life experience, as much as the fact that, uh, I, I kind of coached. I wouldn't necessarily, looking back now, I probably wouldn't really call it coaching. But um, I think as, a, as an experience, it was really, really good. And I, I would certainly recommend anybody that gets the opportunity to do this to, to, to grab it with both hands and go and experience something different. And Sean, how important is it to build a, the word that Lydia used earlier about connections or building a network when you want to work in the coaching industry? I think it's hugely important. You know, you, you outlined at the top that um, in terms of young people coming through that higher education pathway, it's 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 a busy place. It, it, it's competitive. Um, if you're looking to get a you know a full time career where it's your primary occupation, where you get to do, you know coach every day, which you know I'll only echo next next point. It doesn't feel like it's work, so it's it's a privilege. It's a real honour. Um, so yeah, you need to, you need to you need to stand out in different ways. You need to be remembered. Um, I've got. Some great examples of, um, you know, I just make go and make the effort to say hello, go and connect with people, go and network with people. They half the time people haven't got a clue who you are, but you know what? Sometimes they remember something about you, something about your personality. And in this day and age, those interpersonal skills, that ability to interact with individuals on a human level as well as a sport and physical activity level is important. So I imagine young people have all these opportunities coming their way. Look, you can't do everything, but really you've got to sort of stick your neck out there and, and take on some of these opportunities. And it's it's a tough time when, you, when you're growing up and there's all sorts going on. I remember thinking as 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 a, as a young person, oh, you know, these are these are quite intimidating opportunities at time. I'm not sure what to expect. Um, I don't know how it's going to go. Maybe my, my confidence is, is not as, as high as it could be in these, these different situations. But I think the key thing is to is to forget all that and really go for it because as Lydia mentioned who knew like 10 15 years later the roles that she would be in and similarly for, for myself I I never expected but I suppose it was the idea of that if I don't 
I might have regrets because I have so much passion for sport and physical activity and for coaching. So that that's almost going to trump everything else for me. And I really want to go and go and meet these people. So I think networking connections is a huge part. And as small as it might seem right now, I'd encourage people to go and do that. And just following off on that, would you encourage that, that if somebody's at university or they're doing an apprenticeship or even work experience that they start thinking about that early on? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. So I think it's about, look, you know, when it, when it, comes, to, when it comes to coaching, we, you know, as coaches, we talk about the, the plan, the do and the review. The doing bit is, is only a third of it. The planning and the reviewing bit is equal as well. And actually in those times, that is when you have those opportunities to connect, to network, to reflect upon your practice, to think about your values, to think about the opportunities in the future. And I read a, I read a statistic, um, I think it was in the, the, the UK Coaching Population Survey, which um, looks at, at coaches demographically across the country every couple of years and what participants are, are saying about coaches. And one of the things that struck me was it said something along the lines of, even though about a third of coaches have access to this, to a network or a connection, a coach developer or a mentor, only about 7% of them actually take up on it. So I think there's a real opportunity for the next generation to be super connected, to, to have those opportunities to talk about their coaching, to get comfortable with reflecting upon themselves and analyzing themselves. Because let's face it, as a, as, a, as a human race, we don't always like doing that so much. So I think it's a real opportunity for, for those young people to, to do that. Excellent stuff. Nick, again, I can see you nodding your head. What do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think like, like Sean's bang on, but I think the message that, that I, whenever I'm talking to groups of young people, students, etc., cetera, you, you've got to do it yourself. Like nobody's going to come and do this for you. You have to put yourself out there to make these links, to make these connections. and like if I would travel hours to go to a CPD event just to, because I knew that it was a good coach doing something and be like, right, I'm going to drive two hours to go and watch a coach work for an hour and a half. Um, but you have to put yourself out there to do it. And the world of social media now is you can make these connections in a lot easier way than, than I certainly could when I was growing up. And I had a guy who contacted me through Twitter, who a uh, South African rugby coach, um, and we'd swapped a few messages here and there along the way. And he said, look, I'm doing a tour of Europe to go and see some coaches. Come up, can I come and watch you work? And I'm like, yeah, of course you can. You know, I, I picked him up from a train station. We had an hour and a half before. He came into the session. He was stood with me on the grass next to me. I'm asking him stuff. He's asking me. That's the way that you do it. But, you know, this lad has traveled halfway around the world to go and further his own coaching career. But he's gone out of the way to do it nobody's going to do it for you and and if you want to separate yourselves from from your peers as sean said ultimately you're going to need to do you have to make this effort yourself make those links make those contacts you know like if somebody says no or they don't reply because they're too busy don't take it personally don't judge them but you have to still try and make that effort yourself Lydia, I mean, you must, your contact book working with the, the, you know, with the England women team must be huge, but it's taken time to develop those relationships, particularly from a mentor point of view and also people who are fellow coaches as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, they don't happen overnight. Um, I'm lucky that some of those people that, you know, started out as um, kind of like mentors have become great friends, people that I can pick the phone up to, you know, Brent Hills at the FA no longer, no longer works for the FA, but I know I have an issue on camp or I'm unsure about a decision. He's the first person I pick that phone up to. And, and I'm guaranteed an honest bit of feedback. You know, one of his best bits of advice to me was eat the frog for breakfast. Cause as a young coach, I used to really struggle with confrontation. So, you know, he's given me some amazing quotes over time that have given me the confidence in different situations just to have that, you know, person to be able to speak to along the way. But, um, yeah, I think like echoing what everyone else says, it's it's about putting yourself out there. I was actually smiling as um, Nick and Sean were talking because I was thinking back to an opportunity when I was teaching. It was during a half term, I think, and there was an England under 15s camp in Warwick and it was open for people to go and watch. And I, you know, I thought this is something I want to get involved in and have a little look. So I paid for a and b and went up there for like the weekend. I only packed shorts and it tipped down with rain. So I had to like go to sports. Um, sports soccer I think it was and buy an umbrella and I probably look like an absolute idiot stood in this like pair of shorts watching this um, under 15 session but you know that B&B &B for two nights was just an example of I had to try and build those connections and put my face in the right places and, and actually once you do that 
people notice, you know, and they notice the commitment that you put into trying to, you know, be in and around those environments. And, and that's how you build those connections and relationships. And people talk. So, you know, you find one good ally in the game, then, you know, you've picked up probably two or three more. Yeah, brilliant point. Nick, can I ask about coaching styles as well? Because there's a variety of different ways about someone, how someone can coach somebody else. And I, you talk about, I've seen you talk about being player-centered and an empowered approach. Again, you know, 20 years ago, if you think about to the days of Brian Clough, that approach would have been knocked out of the water. But today, particularly you look at Klopp and Guardiola as two, you know, two of the best coaches in the land right now, their style is very different to what it was 20 years ago, isn't it? It is. I mean, you, your maths needs to change. There. That's probably 40, 50 years ago for Clough now. I'm being, uh, I'm being a little bit generous, I think. I'm being generous. <laughs> <laughs> but, but interestingly, so I know, I know players that played for him a lad that used to work for me did one of the England scouts and Clough was player centered in his own way was was player centered um but uh, when you look at coaches like like Klopp and Guardiola at the top end again and and knowing people that, that work at both of the clubs and that know them well so Guardiola is very good at changing his leadership style depending on where he is and his um behaviors based upon what he's trying to achieve at different things so we would see the animated coach on the side of the pitch, you know, pointing and gesticulating and, you know, shouting at people what to do. But behind the scenes, he's um, uh, very, very in touch with individuals and helping them develop. Uh, when it comes to looking at game plans and how they're going to beat teams, he's very um, analytical and process driven in his thinking, which is a very different kind of um mindset and behavior style to somebody that might be all about the people but what he's good at is, is shifting and evolving how he works and uh Klopp is the same you know we see the very uh empathic side of him which is lots of hugs and and that side of things but again he's able to shift and change and and this is what we're probably looking for in the modern day coach that you know i'm sure the um the, the system that Lydia's in and, and Lydia will work with kind of psychologists that will kind of support that kind of culture and environment. And I'm sure they're, they're stretching and challenging Lydia to recognize that, you know, she might come from a, a here as a default position, but in order to maintain effectiveness and impact, she needs to start to work in different ways in order to connect with different players. So ultimately it's, it's recognizing where you are, what your strength might be, but also kind of recognizing some of your own blind spots in your coaching and, and how you then go about developing those as well. But, the best coaches have the ability to to move and flex their leadership styles uh, as the as the situation requires really that nicely segues into my next topic actually which is about skills um sean let's come to you skills that young people need to develop if they want to become a sports coach yeah i was just going to add to the next point i have this 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 view and it's kind of linked to you know uh, previous coaching models uh, have gone gone before you, you've got to you've got to be able to to obviously coach the activity there is still an element of that you, you you can't just leave that alone and that's kind of this traditional space but it's more now about understanding what your coaching looks like in your environment and how you create an environment for that person in front of you or for that group of people in front of you how can you engage them how can you entice them so it's a really positive inclusive um, experience and the other bit is about how you coach those relationships. So you might have a really good environment. You might have a um, really good grasp of your subject knowledge, your task or activity, but you also need to continue to keep working on those relationships. If you're um, you know, an individual sport, that, that relationship between a coach and athlete is obviously really important. If it's a, a group or team sport, um, then again, you've got a number of different relationships between you and them and obviously each other that you need to harness and I suppose put a lot of energy into. And I guess that's that's probably sounds a little bit in that talent environment. Let's, let's step back from that and look at the grassroots community environment. Maybe, I don't know, a local, a local community club that plays, I don't know, basketball, handball, whatever it may be. It could be 15, 20 people coming to you with very different backgrounds, very different circumstances. That day that they've just had, whether that be that somewhat, you know, an adult session where they've come from work, or maybe they've um, got got two, three children that they've had to look after, drop off at school. They, they come with all sorts of um, situations. We all do. And I think where we're moving to is now the ability 
um, to coach the individual and to coach the group as much as the task or the activity itself. And learning and the training programs that are supporting young people, hopefully they'll start to feel that much more now than perhaps um, when I when I certainly went through the coach education pathway. It was all about this is what you've got to do as a coach. And to be honest, there wasn't a huge amount of reflection or sense making. I had to do that as an individual. Um, but today, I'd like to think that more often than not, a young person um, experiencing coach education or learning and development programs will start to get a feel of these important qualities, the sense of being a friendly person, the sense of interacting with others, the sense of understanding the needs of that person. Um, those, those are certainly some of, the, some of the top qualities, I guess, a, a, coach, a young coach will need moving forward. And Lydia, does somebody need to be flexible in their approach and also be adaptable in the way they coach as well? Yeah, I think definitely because, you know, the, the players you've got, so you've got a squad of 20 players, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of difference in there. There's difference in personalities. There's difference in training age. You know, like when the girls come into our international path where I could have one that's been at Centre of Excellence for eight years by the time they reach us, but you might have one that's actually come from grassroots and has less of a training age or hasn't been in foot involved in football for as long. So there's so many different factors, their family, you know, what background they've got, just it's a whole host. So I think without having an awareness of that, and that's where relationships are so important. I know we've spoken about it a lot, but I think as the coach, unless you really try and, you know, get to know those people as individuals and, and actually open up conversations that are outside of football, then there could be sort of a massive bit, bit of insight that that you're just losing completely. Um, and one of my other favourite quotes uh, around these relationships is that people don't care what you know until they know that you care. So I think just having that individual um, openness with players and showing them that you're there to support them is a really big trigger in them hopefully opening up and that relationship being built. And I'm a big believer that, you know, outside of the football, there's there's so much that can be done to build those relationships and and really push those individuals on. Like I'm adamant and about this like holistic approach to to football. So the girls come away of us, you know, they want to play for England. What a great like experience it might be. For example, we went to USA in February, you know, 10 days in USA. You're not going to turn that down as a 17 year old. But um, we took the girls to Disney on the last day because I'm adamant that, you know, in 10 years time, they won't remember the results against US, but they'll remember that they went to Disney. And I think, you know, those relationships that you build and your real understanding of what's really driving those players, but actually remembering that they are just, you know, 17 year old kids that are going to get excited by Disney. That's all part of, you know, how you develop them and improve them as players. Nick, it is still important, though, to have those those traditional skills, if you like, of, you know, good writing skills, being organised mathematics, data, I believe they're just as important in coaching as they have ever been. Yeah, I think it's important that you have a, um, a, a core foundation. And I think where things have certainly moved from a technology perspective and, you know, probably, you know, arguably a lot of young people now are probably better placed than us older people like me and Sean and Lydia, I'm not including you and the old people, but um, uh, that, uh, you know, Session planning is now done a lot on cloud-based technology platforms and use of data analytics or analysis software or coding of games or player performance. A lot of that is done through tech. So having a really good understanding and grasp of technology um, is important, but the, the core skills ultimately is still going to be important because you're not going to be able to get away from, uh, you know, if I'm watching a game, you know, I'm still scribbling notes in a book about things that I need to reflect upon, whether it's about my own coaching or some stuff that I might have seen the kids do. So it's still a really important skill to do. On a side note, I mentioned that I work in tennis and, of course, there's a big debate at the moment about on-court coaching. It will be allowed on the women's tour when the season restarts once the pandemic it's passed and it's, di it's divided tennis fans right down the middle. Some believe that it shouldn't be there, that the minute the player is on the court, it's just them and the opponent and they figure it out themselves. And others thinking, actually, it's quite good because now we can actually hear what the coach is saying to the player at the breaks and at the change of ends. And it's fascinating hearing the language that is used, trying to encourage them, giving them direction. Do you think we'll see that more from a tennis perspective? We're going to see more on-court coaching, do you think? Let's go with uh, Nick for that one. 
Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I think I think sport will constantly evolve, and um, I think largely what uh, the tennis fan thinks is probably less important to what the players want from it. You know, so some players will probably be quite happy that they're, they're once they're on, once they're on, they're the ones that are playing the match. They're the ones that have got to make the decisions for themselves. Others may want a little bit of support and advice. So. I think it just depends on what what the, the direction of travel for the sport looks like, really. So you could say the same will happen from a golf perspective. Is that you know would golf coaches be allowed on court at uh, on course? Sorry, at major sports events. I think the reality is it probably already happens without people knowing. Uh, there'd be uh, I'm sure between the player and the box, there's signals and all sorts that go on that we're not aware of uh that involves use of data going from coach or someone else somewhere to coach set up in the box inadvertently to players like that's probably already happening so all this is is just kind of making it a bit more of a public thing to be honest absolutely and that's actually a really good point sean because we're seeing now how integral and how important a coach is to a team or to a player, aren't we? Now that in the world of social media and television and, and radio, the coach is, you know, you know the coach's names now, whereas a few years ago, you wouldn't have known that person existed at all. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that dynamic's fascinating with regards to tennis there in the sense that on the face of it, the athlete is very much in control. Or well, that's the perception that, that I see when I'm watching a game of, of tennis. And the player ultimately making those decisions that that would be interesting to see how that plays out in terms of that dynamic and whether or not the coach starts to play a, a greater role in influencing the outcome or, or the decisions of their athlete and and the dynamics there and that interplay is intriguing a little bit like i suppose golf with caddies and the player uh, and, and and the golfer so yeah uh, coaches are are very much in in the forefront today they you know particularly within team sports where you see them and talking about their decisions talking about the performance but but ultimately it, it comes back down to 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 the athletes i think that goes back to coaching styles and and understanding you as a coach and what type of coach you want to be and when we talk about person-centered or player-centered it doesn't mean that we don't use some of those traditional methods because that might be what a player or a group of individuals need at that given moment so i think yeah coaches have got to be uh, thick skinned, particularly as they start to, I suppose, move into those talent spaces where uh, we're moving from that developmental pathway into a bit more of performance and a results pathway, because you are, you are in the spotlight a little bit. So this goes back to, as you work through your pathway, the importance of having good people around you, but also exposing you to some other skill development areas that you're gonna need, particularly in that talent space that I'm sure probably Lydia could talk about in terms of now uh, looking after a national age group team. Actually, Lydia, do you want to pick up on that point that Sean's just made? Yeah, I think, you know, um, probably in the women's game, you know, as the profile of it increases, there'll be an even bigger increase of kind of like availability of female coaches. And where you see it now, you know, the women's football show is a great example, you know, right after the game, they're now live with comments and, you know, five years ago, not even two, three years ago, that didn't exist. So I think as a coach now, resilience is key. You know, social media has massive pressures. Um, not everyone's going to agree with decisions you make or or things that you do, but being thick skinned is so important. Having a trust in in what you're going after. And I think as a coach now, if I was going into a club environment, I think your vision and philosophy of what it is you want, um, knowing that, you know, getting your players to buy into it is, is key because then when you do have bumps along the way, you know, you can kind of stay focused on what the end goal might be. So I think, you know, you've got to be resilient. You've got to be able to adapt. You've got to be able to deal with those little pinch points of pressure and know actually who the right person to release to is in that moment. And that's where those relationships are key, because, you know, with how big social media is becoming, if you let out that bit of pressure or pinch point to the wrong person, it could be suddenly all over the papers or so it's, it's really important that I think you have good people around you um, that you can release to. But yeah, you're just ready for different directions of um, fire and um sometimes you're gonna need a quick answer and you're gonna need to deflect but i think as a as a coach you, you're always thinking on your feet in session so it's probably similar in terms of a characteristic but just of a different dynamic now that 
the interest is increasing. Yeah, it's a really good point because you know, now with social media, we do know who these coaches are and they're having to do, as you pointed out, Lydia, having to do media interviews now, being on the radio and, and newspaper interviews and things like that. So that spotlight is going to get brighter and brighter as the years progress for sure in coaching. So let's round this up now. I'd like to ask you about what we call extracurricular activities. If someone's looking to a young person wants to become a coach, what can they do outside of studying for a qualification or if they're doing a, an apprenticeship? Something that they could do that will look good to a possible um, recruiter or something on the CV. Let's start with you, Nick. Uh, yeah, I think it's probably been touched upon a little bit at the moment. Um, uh, the key thing for me is try and get as much experience in as many different places as possible. And that would be um, working in primary schools. It could be working in secondary schools, um, different age groups, uh, disability. It could be talent pathway. It could be boys sport, girls sport adults i think the more you can get that breadth of experience it will really help challenge and refine what you really love and find passionate about coaching the most and will help you then settle probably into that place that that you might want to work my coaching now is with uh under six kids playing rugby and uh it, it's fantastic um it's not in the talent pathway and I'm comfortable with that because I recognize it. It's not about the ego of the coach. Um, my son's there and I love watching him run around playing rugby with his mates. Um, don't understand rugby. It's a crazy game. Um, but ultimately what it is, is, is creating that environment for kids to fall in love with sport, whatever it might be. So that would be my top thing. Um, get as much experience in as many different sports in as many different environments as you can. Because hopefully that will then kind of generate where your real passion lies. And for us as an employer or uh, somebody that employs coaches in different roles, seeing people with a breadth of experience is um, it's going to be really, really important. Just as a side note, just when you mentioned about rugby, uh, Nick, something just popped into my head. I'll always remember listening to, to Danny Cowley, um, the Cowley brothers, of course. And he was talking about how in his coaching career, he read books from about different sports and the different types of coaching styles that are used in in sport and he would he mentioned about reading the book by sir clive woodward about the the rugby world cup and he picked up so many tips from that book and also met with sir clive woodward himself and who gave more you know tips and and guidance and advice and i find that fascinating that there is there are coaches out there willing to look at other sports and look at different coaching styles and, and adapt it to their own so it's interesting what you mentioned there about rugby which is a sport i don't get either by the way um sean for you what can somebody do for, uh, to enhance their their career prospects if they want to work in sports coaching yeah um i, th I think the volunteering um angle is really important there's there are you know there's far more opportunities in far more uh, settings with lots of different audiences so yeah go and go and get that experience as, as nick was saying i think there's something also about um Taking the time before and after your session to really to really make sense of that, so sense of what you've been doing or what you've been coaching. Um, we, you know, going back to the idea of travelling an hour to to coach somewhere, which I've done on many occasions, or if not longer, I often use the, the time driving there or driving back to to think about what the session means to me and to to start to really hone some of my ideas and thoughts. Why I think that's important. So I don't think it matters what age you are. You have a voice and you can share that. You can share your thoughts. It's understanding um, that in sport, it's foot and coaching is no different in terms of being full of opinions. But, but actually, if, if you come with those experiences and you come with that thought process, be inclined to share. So in terms of going back to, to networking, et cetera, be inclined to share. So I think events is a good opportunity as well. Volunteering events, get close up to 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 different opportunities whether that be olympics whether that be world championships whether that be local events get get involved and start to see the, the different angles the different thoughts uh, the different ways of, of doing things lydia how important is volunteering for someone if they want to develop their confidence yeah definitely i think i mean for me if i was in the shoes of someone at uni now i'd I think the first thing I do is think about what it is that I want to move into from a coaching perspective. And then I try and seek out someone who's I can get hold of that I can offer to volunteer and almost become their shadow. 
because I think from a confidence perspective, if you can almost see someone else going out and doing it, you can see them making mistakes. You're almost, you know, you're almost being a miniature version of them and you're gaining um, loads of learning and experience from what you're seeing. But actually, one of the biggest things I learned in the, in the four years that I was an assistant coach to senior football was a lot of things were brilliant that I could learn off the person I was working with. And, and some of them were learnings of things that actually, if I was in the same situation again, I might do differently. So I think um, from a confidence perspective, if you can work with someone and see them doing it, then I think it makes it feel more attainable. I think it gives you the protection that it's not you in the firing line in terms of making the decisions, but you know, whether that's volunteering to pick up cones with a WSL first team or, you know, going in to observe training sessions or whatever it might be that it is you want to do. I think it's um, it's really important that you like take that opportunity and use that to help develop your confidence. Can I, can I just, nice, add, just jump in there? Oh, on, I was just going to, I was just, I was just going to jump in there. I think it's a really valid point that you can't go and consume every little bit of learning. So the important bit in terms of understanding where you want to go and where you want to get to and have someone to work through that is important that you can start to, to get the learning that means the most for you is a danger. And I was probably a little bit like this as a young person around the sport that I coach. I wanted to know everything. It's just It's just not possible. But having an understanding of yourself and where you want to go and how to get there that then all of a sudden makes the learning and the opportunities around you more meaningful. So I, ju I just wanted to echo what, what Lydia was saying there. No, all great points. It's important to, to have a plan at least and have an idea in your head of where you want to take your journey. And that brings us to the end of the Careers in Sport webinar focusing on sports coaching. It's been great to, to have your company and I hope that we've been able to give you some ideas and some tips and some guidance how to start you out on your sports coaching journey of course i need to say a warm thank you to our guests that's mr nick levitt nick how can we find you on social media uh at n levitt on twitter which is uh n l e v e -T, t or uh on my blog are riversofthinking.com brilliant stuff my thanks to sean kitson for joining us as well sean how can we find you on social media uh, probably the best place, Twitter, so at KitSean, K-I-T-S-I-O-N. So, yeah, usually either talking about coaching or sport and physical activity. Brilliant stuff. Thank you for that. And Lydia, my thanks to you, Lydia Bedford. How can we find you on social media? Um, yeah, also on Twitter, um, it's at Lids87, L-Y-D-S-87. Brilliant stuff. Thank you. Thanks for watching, as I said, the careers in sport webinar focusing on sports coaching of course if you want more information head over online at careers in sports.co.uk thanks for watching and we'll see you soon